Today we have, we have uh, Dr. Imran Wahid, a consultant psychiatrist, consultant psychiatrist with extensive uh, experience of writing uh, reports. And today we're going to be talking about hoarding disorder. Dr. Imran Wahid, welcome uh, to uh, the program. And uh, uh, can you first uh, tell us uh, what hoarding disorder is about and wh how, uh, how it presents itself as, as a problem to people? Yeah, hi, good to be with you. Um, I think um, most people will know what the term hoarding means. You know, so if somebody said someone was, you know, hoarding uh, something, people would know, you know, what that means. It, it generally means you keep a large number of things. Um, you don't get rid of them. So you can't, you don't throw things away and you, you gradually increase the amount of things you have. So, you know, somebody could hoard a lot of wealth or, you know, hoard a lot of belongings or, furniture or, or different things. So in essence, uh, when we talk about hoarding, we're saying it's accumulating things, accumulating belongings and uh, generally accumulating them and not really getting rid of them. So you, you, you tend to keep them um, for long periods of time and you have difficulty parting with things. Um, as to when this becomes a problem or you know a disorder, this is something which uh, psychiatrists and mental health professionals have discussed uh, in terms of when it becomes a, a problem and, and usually when it starts affecting one's functioning, one's environment or the environment around you, um, that's when it really starts to become uh, a problem. You know, if you've just got a stamp collection which, you know, uh, takes up, uh, you know, just a, a few ring binders or something like that, it's not really going to cause you a major problem. Uh, but often what you're finding in people who have a, a severe hoarding problem is that there is no, there's no way to even get into their property. Um, there's no way to, um, to move around in the property. I mean, one of, one, one of the cases I, I've seen in recent years, um, although the, the, the patient lived in a four bedroom house, she was sleeping on a camp bed uh, in the kitchen because all of the living space that would usually be habitable uh, is completely occupied by possessions um, and belongings. Um, so that's really, in, in essence, what hoarding is. So, so I suppose uh, the the situation is uh, the, where, where the problems arise is when uh, people with hoarding disorders uh, get into problem problems with the uh, housing authorities. Uh, and we've had these uh, type of cases before, which we've dealt with, uh, that there's somebody with a hoarding disorder and they've been served an eviction notice and it's... Uh, uh, so the house is full uh, of things that they've been holding on to uh, and they've been uh, served with proceedings uh, to vacate the property. Now, how is it that we, uh, uh, how is that looked at in terms of, uh, from a psychiatric report uh, perspective, how is that, how is that actually uh, uh, dealt with? Is, is there any benefit in somebody uh, having a psychiatric report for that kind of, uh, for that kind of uh, situation? Or what situations would that present itself in having a psychiatric report? You're, you're quite right. Sometimes uh, people who have a hoarding problem, they come to the attention of others. So uh, people with a hoarding problem sometimes don't really regard it as a problem. They have limited insight uh, into how much of a problem it is. Uh, and in fact, um, that can be, um, you know, th that, that can be a characteristic of the condition that the, the individual who's hoarding doesn't actually realize the impact it's having. So sometimes you, you get complaints um, from neighbors, um, particularly when people start hoarding things outdoors. Um, like, you know, you, you, you might find a front garden or a back garden or a driveway um, is completely covered or, it, you know, in, 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 in accommodation which has shared communal areas, you'll find that the person with a hoarding problem, their belongings have started to encroach into the shared areas. So for example, you know, let's say there's a stairwell or uh, an area outside two apartments you'll find that the, the person who has a hoarding problem starts to put their belongings there. Sometimes you get concerns from the fire service. Um, they have some reason to be involved um, with an individual and they're worried that the conditions within the property uh, are a fire hazard. Uh, sometimes uh, people who have the problem, their relatives uh, express concerns. Um, for example, um, it could be, it could relate even to uh, child protection matters and child safeguarding. Um, because if you have a young child in such an environment, it can be quite difficult in terms of um, the space they have if the, if the entire accommodation 
is covered in belongings. And often, as you quite say, as you quite rightly say, it's, it's the landlord, whether that's a private landlord or you know a housing association or a local authority, uh, they have concerns. You know, they may go in and do an inspection, you know, like annually, or um, workmen go in to you know complete a gas safety certificate or upgrade the electrics or upgrade the the you know the, the glazing the windows. And and often, you know, in these cases, I will find that the workmen have reported. Uh, to the council that you know there's no way we can go into this property it's not safe for us to work or there's no way to turn to change the electrics in the property because the property is just um, completely covered with belongings and we can't work safely so so then yeah I mean move, moving on to your ne the next part of the of your of your point or your question is what's the purpose of a psychiatric report well you know you 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 really want to understand um let's say for example, the example you give, somebody's being evicted. You, you really want to understand um, in a case like this, has the person actually got uh, a condition? So hoarding disorder is now a recognized condition, um, a recognized diagnosis. Um, it's a form of mental illness. Um, it's recognized, for example, in the American, um, the, the, the DSM-5, which is the American I've classification. Got, I've, I've got a question about this. Uh, I mean, the hoarding disorder, uh, is that linked to any other conditions like uh, OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder or uh, other, other mental health issues? Or is, does, it, does it usually present itself on its own? Um, it can present itself on its own. Um, historically, if you think in, in terms of, you know, where we were maybe... 15, 20 years ago, people used to think it's usually um, part of a condition known as obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. Um, but now we're, we're finding it actually seems to be a distinct entity. So there are some people who develop hoarding problems and have different mental illnesses. So for example, obsessive compulsive disorder could be linked to hoarding. There are other serious mental health conditions like depression um, that can be linked to hoarding or it it can be one of the reasons why it appears that somebody is hoarding. Um, so for example, I, I, I recently saw a patient um, who has insight into the, the state of her property, but she simply has no interest or motivation um, to actually deal with the clutter in her property. And that is because she is suffering from quite a severe depressive illness. Similarly, patients with severe uh, and enduring mental illness like schizophrenia, um, Many of those patients develop what we call negative symptoms, things like apathy um, and, and lack of motivation, and, and they also can uh, they also can have a, a functional decline in their ability to look after their property due to their illness, um, and that as well um, is sometimes um, related to you know the, the excessive accumulation of belongings. But hoarding disorder itself now we we know has been classified as a as a distinct entity. So the uh, American Psychiatric Association has uh, set out in something called DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, um, some criteria um, for diagnosing it. Right, um, so uh, when, when we look at these um, uh, disorders, I mean, obviously there's a, uh, the, there's a, you can look at it from a legal perspective and also you can look at it from a health perspective. So it only seems uh, to come to light when somebody has a kind of a social problem in terms of housing and in that type of scenario, I mean, very few people, um, and, you know, there can be people who are, you know, we'd normally just consider to be like eccentric, you know, that they collect uh, stuff and they never, you know, they never get rid of it. And that's not seen to be a problem, but it's more so considered a problem when people, um, you know, run into uh, problems with uh, authorities, with the, uh, with housing, it's, it's particularly in housing and not in, uh, in any other area. So, I mean, what what are the treatments uh, that could be offered there for people who have uh, have this disorder? And, uh, it, you know, it seems that it's just picked up as a disorder uh, when they encounter problems with, in, in the housing sector largely, uh, but it may go unrecognised um, and... Uh, you know, GPs, etc., may just pass it off as just somebody being, you know, overly, um, you know, overly possessive about things and not necessarily a disorder. Well, look, the the, the issue is that uh, it's. I agree that it's picked up by you know in the way you mentioned, but 
actually, I mean, if you do home visits, and I, I've spent a, a long part of my career doing working in home treatment, so you, you get to see how people live, and then that does sometimes give you a means to uh, diagnosing the condition, or at least alerting you to the possibility of the diagnosis. Of course, if somebody's just coming to clinic um, and they're having consultations in clinic, you can't see their living environment. And if they don't volunteer that information and no one reports the concerns about the environment, uh, it won't come to light. Um, so uh, we do sometimes notice it when we do home visits that you know that there is you know a, a major problem, and sometimes that starts as soon as you arrive at the house. Um, you know, you, you see the driveway, or you you know you're able to see the garden, and that does alert you to the possibility of hoarding. But then, of course, the the reason for psychiatric assessment is to determine well what's going on here. Is it as you say? Is it that somebody is you know to use your term uh, somewhat eccentric, uh, or is there actually a, a recognised uh, mental disorder here? Um, so we don't just jump to the conclusion that it's hoarding disorder. We we try and understand. Um, you know what the condition is and you know we refer to the diagnostic criteria that have been set out um, but in terms of treatment I mean the, the main the main form of treatment is, is what we call cognitive behavioral therapy um, so psychological therapy really um, and, and that's that is the main form of treatment um, there is some evidence um, although it's very very limited that antidepressant medication can also be helpful um, but uh, the, 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 the better evidence um, is uh, for um, psychological therapy. There's not a great deal of evidence that um, what you see on these TV shows, you know, you get these TV shows, particularly from America, where, you know, they, 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 they get somebody's property, somebody who's been hoarding, and they put everything in storage. So they completely gut the place, um, put everything in storage, and then they get the, get the person who suffers from the condition to decide what they want back. Right. Um, what the, you never see on those programs is how those people are doing after like 12 months or three years. Usually they, because you haven't dealt with the underlying problem, uh, you know, you haven't dealt with the psychological processes which underlie the hoarding behavior. You haven't really understood any of that. You've just simply almost forcibly decluttered uh, the property. So we know that forcible decluttering of a property does not work. Some councils sometimes want to do that. Um, but it's not an intervention that works. Right. Now, um, is it regarded in law as, um, as a disability, this condition, um, under the Equality um, Disability uh, uh, Act? I mean, the, the, the issue here is, I mean, it's back to your earlier point on why would you get a psychiatric report. So the issues that, that normally people want to look at, particularly where someone is facing possession proceedings, where they, they face losing their home, is, you know, does this person have... A disorder you know a mental impairment um, and then you you address the issue of disability under the Equality Act so you know does that mental impairment does it have a substantial adverse effect on their ability to carry out day-to-day -day activities um, and and is that a long-term effect so those are the kind of issues you're looking at so those are you know the Disability Act um, it, it sets out the definition of disability that the individual should have an impairment that impairment could be mental could be physical and that it should have a substantial, i.e. What the, what the law says is that means more than trivial uh, impact um, on someone's day-to-day -day activities and adverse impact. And it should be long-term. And the, the law sets out that long-term means that it, you know, it, it will persist for more than 12 months or it is likely to persist for more than 12 months. So, yeah, I mean, frequently it is the case that if somebody does have a hoarding disorder, that it does affect... Uh, their ability to carry out day-to-day -day activities um, because it consumes them. Um, you know, it, it, it is the thing which kind of takes over their life. Um, so that's, you know, that, that, that can be quite, quite disabling for the patient. So frequently patients with a hoarding disorder will meet um, the criteria um, for having a disability. Then of course, if they meet the criteria for having a disability, then the protection that is afforded to them through the Equality Act applies to them. Um, and that can be quite important in defending possession proceedings um, to prove that an individual, you know, that this is not just a choice that they are making, that actually they're suffering from an illness and that this illness constitutes a disability. So, so I mean, that, that moves me on to um, uh, my, my, my final point. Um, how, how, do, how do courts actually um, 
how, how do courts actually uh, view, view this disorder when they go through uh, position proceedings and other types of proceedings? So I suppose my question is, number one, uh, what types of proceedings does it, have you seen hoarding disorder present itself? And number two, uh, you know, how do courts actually view it? Yeah, maybe you could run through some uh, examples of uh, some, some, some cases that you might have been through. I mean, the, the issue of disability is, is fundamental because um, there, there is law around this. That if, so if somebody is disabled, um, you know, they, the, the, I mean, the, 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 the famous um, kind of case was um, one in the Supreme Court where, where somebody raised a defense under the disability discrimination, uh, of disability discrimination under the Equality Act. Um, and in, in the judgment, Lady Hale, she said that no landlord is allowed to evict a disabled tenant because of something arising in consequence of the disability, unless he can show eviction to be a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. He is thus obliged to be more considerate towards a disabled tenant than he is towards a non-disabled one. Um, so, look, I mean, the issue here is what, how do the courts view it? That, that's your question. Well, if 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 it's a case of somebody is being evicted because of something that arises from a disability, then the court will want that to be given serious consideration, whether it is proportionate, whether the local authority have carried out a proper assessment of the proportionality of what they're proposing. Um, obviously, the court will also want to know about, you know, to what extent is it the disability? Is it, is it that, you know, is it completely the disability or are there other factors at play? Um, the kind of proceedings you see, yes, you see possession proceedings, so where, where people are facing losing their property, but you also see injunction proceedings. Um, so you will sometimes, um, you, you will sometimes um, see that uh, the, the local authority or the landlord wants an injunction um, applied uh, to an individual, and the terms of that will be that, you know, they have to cooperate with the council or whoever the council appoints in decluttering the property. So often the question the court wants to know is how feasible is it that the person is going to be able to uh, adhere, understand that injunction and adhere to it. And that's sometimes um, an area where uh, the court, uh, and it's probably a topic for another day, it's where the court wants to know about somebody's capacity to adhere to an injunction, because generally the court does not want to make uh, an injunction where somebody does not have the mental capacity to adhere to it because essentially you'd be setting up the person to fail if you know that their condition means uh, that they're going to break the injunction so those those are usually the kind of the areas that uh, you know the, the courts look at of course the court wants to know well you know what treatment is there um for this individual is there a likelihood that they could get better how long would it take for them to get better? So usually you're asked a series of questions about the treatment, um, the likely prognosis uh, of the condition, the, you know, the time period in which the improvement might take place. And you've got to bear in mind that this is quite a difficult condition to treat. And even with psychological therapy, um, sometimes the prognosis in some cases is not so good. Dr. Wahid, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, it's uh, been a very informative discussion and uh, we hope to have you on again. Thanks, it's been uh, great to be with you. Thanks. Thank you.